All right, well, today we're going to start uh, talking about plate tectonics. This will be kind of the first major subject we talk about with respect to geology. Previously, we've talked about some intro stuff, and today we're going to get into kind of the big backbone of geology. So we'll talk about plate tectonics. It's going to take a couple of lectures or so. And I do that because this is sort of the underlying process on this planet that drives everything else. And it's unique to this planet that we know of, at least everything else we see in our own, our own solar system. I'm sure this process happens on other planets that we haven't discovered yet, but it's critical in circulating nutrients in the atmosphere, in the crust, you know, keeping life on our planet, keeping the atmosphere on the planet. Um, you know, it's kind of a critical process and it drives everything we talk about for the rest of the semester when it comes to rocks and minerals and volcanoes and earthquakes and rivers and streams and glaciers and deserts and all the rest of it. So this is the first thing I talk about because it is the underlying process. And from here, we move on during the rest of the semester. So to kind of get started with plate tectonics, do a little bit of history. And to do a little bit of history, we have to go back about 100 years when this process was beginning to be understood by the greater community. And it was put forth by a guy called Alfred Regener in 1954. He was the first guy to sort of suggest that this was going on on our planet. And he came up with this idea called continental drift. And his idea is that the continents are sort of drifting around a little bit. If you look at a basic map like this, there were some lines of evidence that he put forth that suggested the continents were drifting. First off, if you kind of look at a general map of the world today, and if we focus in on the Atlantic Basin, it kind of looks a little bit like the pieces to a jigsaw puzzle. You know, it kind of looks a bit like you can sort of just bring them together, right? You can slide South America right into this little nook in Africa, and you can slide this part of Africa into the eastern seaboard and close the top part of the Atlantic and the bottom part of the Atlantic. And if you do so, it kind of looks like you're putting the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle together. You know, kind of like that. It's very convenient. And I think that initially this was the thought. As mapping got better, and keep in mind, before, say, 1900, maps of the world were pretty crude at best. And so as mapping got more accurate, this idea that, wow, that is really close, kind of started to be realized. But it was more than just that. Fossils, what are called index fossils. There were certain fossils that lined up on both sides of, in this case, the Atlantic Basin. Not just right here, but in other areas around the world. This is just one example. But there are rocks of a very specific age, in this case, where the fossils are exactly the same on either side of the Atlantic. Not just one fossil, but a series of fossils. In other words, the life that existed inside the rocks of a particular age were exactly the same on either side of the Atlantic Basin. Not just one fossil, but the plants, the animals, that sort of thing. If you look at the life recorded inside the rocks, it's exactly the same. Now, if you think about that for a minute, The ecology in this part of the world, in southern South America, is completely different in today's world than it is in southern Africa. You've got completely different plants, completely different animals, because the ecology is different. It would be kind of weird, actually, if you had the exact same ecology here in today's world on the surface 
as you do over here. You don't see that pretty much anywhere. But if you look at the fossils of a certain age, inside rocks of a certain age, they're exactly the same. And that really only makes sense if this was one cohesive piece. Uh, I have like two questions. So, like, whenever the Pangea happened, was it like, did these houses start separating? Or, or was it like just like a river in between and like that? Oh, we're getting into that in great gory detail, so. Uh, it's obviously a river. And then, second question uh, are, Is South America moving like left at the same time Africa is moving right? Or yeah. Or like... Yeah. So it wasn't. It wasn't that there was like one mass of them, but it was like there's still like four people. Yeah, due to continental drift, they moved. Yeah, there, now, there, we're going to go into this in, in great gory detail as we go into. We'll talk about how they broke up and how they spread, how fast they're spreading, and all that. So, yeah. Isn't it like an inch a year? It's about as fast as your fingernail grows. It's things we can measure. We can measure this with satellites and lasers and things like this today. Back then, though, they had no idea. But beyond the fact that you have these index fossils that only make sense when you have one particular region showing a specific ecology. The rocks themselves were the same across the ocean basins. For example, the Appalachian Mountains, which is one of the older mountain ranges on the planet, extends from Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, all the way up through here, up into New England, eastern Canada, and then across the ocean basin into northern UK, Scotland, and then into Scandinavia. That is part of the same mountain range. The rocks are exactly the same. And it only kind of makes sense if somehow they were sort of split in half here and separated. Because it's like following a road where a road has been broken in half. You just, they just go right across continuously. So there's, there were some lines of evidence, like these index fossils, like the rocks themselves, and a few other things that only made sense if the continents were together at some point in the past and had, had been drifting apart ever since. Now, in 1915, this guy who came up with this idea called continental drift was kind of laughed out of the room. Like, oh, yeah, the continents are moving around and everything, you know. Humor this guy. And he had this idea that at some point in the past, you had this supercontinent called Pangea, where all the continents were together. They didn't know when or how, but at some point, if you look at the rock record, it only made sense if at some point in the past they were all together and have been moving apart ever since. And they gave this supercontinent a name and they called it Pangea. Now, this guy you know, was laughed out. You know, that could possibly be the case. Because back then, they didn't have the tools or the technology to study it like we do in today's world and see it. It was just an idea. But it was an idea that made sense, that, that, that explained the evidence that you could go down and look at. So at some point in the past, you had the supercontinent. And that supercontinent has been breaking up. And all these little pieces, like, like ice on a pond, have been drifting apart for each other ever since. Now, in today's world, we know the date in the past of this. So if you start about 200 million years ago and begin to fast forward a little bit, you can see these things spread apart. So from 200 to 150 to 100 to 50 to today's world. And I don't know if this is going to work. I guess not. This is supposed to be a little movie showing it pulling apart. So from about 1915 to about the Second World War, there were scientists working on this, like, you know, what the heck is going on? Is this reality? Are these moving apart? And not everybody was on board by any stretch of the imagination that at some point in the past they were together and have been moving apart for the past couple hundred million years to where we see them today. Well, during the Second World War, all this began to change. You know, the Second World War was obviously a, 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 you know, a bad event, but there were some critical pieces of technology that were invented out of necessity during that time 
that are now used for other things, and one of which during the time was this thing called sonar. We developed sonar back then because that is when submarines sort of began to be used a lot more than they had before. Now, submarines don't have windows on them. So if you're going to go underground or under the water, I'm sorry, a few hundred feet or in some cases a couple thousand feet and drive something with no window, you need to know what's down there. Are you going to hit something? And so sonar was developed during the Second World War. And sonar is basically just a sound wave that's released by a ship and that sound wave is reflected by whatever happens to be below it. And that signal comes back up to the ship and it's recorded. The longer the round trip, the deeper the water. The shorter the round trip, the more shallow the water. And so during the Second World War, the military spent an inordinate amount of time mapping out the ocean basins around the world as best they could so that you could drive a submarine without hitting something. Before the Second World War, people sort of had this idea that, well, maybe the ocean floor, we know it's kind of deep in some areas. We don't know exactly how deep, but it's pretty deep. It's just flat. So, you know, once you get away from the continental shelf, you just put your foot down and go. What's the big deal? As long as you know how deep the water actually is. Turns out, though, that after mapping the ocean basin for a, a period of time, they discovered that it's not flat at all. In fact, there's quite the contours back there. And they discovered what's called the Mid-Oceanic Ridge. And the Mid-Oceanic Ridge is, in fact, the longest, most continuous mountain range on the planet. It's 18,000 miles long. Nobody had any idea this existed before the ocean floor began to get mapped out. And so, you know, isn't that interesting? So that's great. You know, if you're going to be driving submarines through here, especially nuclear power submarines, you don't want to hit something like that, right? So you map out where the topography is in the ocean basin. And they discover this gigantic mountain range called the Mid-Oceanic Ridge. They also were able to map out in more detail these continental margins that exist off of some continents like North America and Europe and Africa. And these continental margins are very complex. They're not just smooth contours. These continental margins go from shallow water here, where you're generally less than a couple hundred feet deep in water depth, to about 12,000 feet deep and not a very long lateral distance. And these slopes, that go down from the edge of the continental margin to the ocean basin floor are very complex and they're dissected by, can by canyons that are extremely complex and deep. Very much like if you go to the front range in Denver and look up at the mountains and all the canyons. It's a great place to hide a Russian nuclear sub and just sit there undetected forever. And so the military spent a lot of time and money to figure out exactly what that looked like so that that sort of thing can be mapped out. And it'd be more difficult for Russian subs to sit there. Not just here, but anywhere in the world. And so from a plate tectonics perspective, though, this mid-oceanic ridge was discovered. And this mid-oceanic ridge is pretty extensive. It runs all the way down the, the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, this picture doesn't show it that well, but into the Indian Ocean and then around and right up the Pacific Ocean. A gigantic mountain range. It's not, it's the largest mountain range in terms of its aerial extent, 18,000 miles or so. But it's not a super tall mountain range, it's not like the Himalaya or something like that. Uh, you have about five to 8,000 feet worth of relief there. So whereas these darker colors here, which represent the abyssal flatter areas of the ocean where you might have a water depth going from 12 to 15,000 feet below the surface. You rise up as you hit these ridges, five to 8,000 feet. Are there any points like that are above the water that people go on? Yeah, absolutely. 
there are several island chains through here, like the Azores, for example, where there are pieces that stick up. Absolutely. All the way around through here. No. Uh, the most famous one is this guy right here, Iceland. Iceland is the largest landmass associated with the Mid-Oceanic Ridge anywhere on the planet that sticks up. And you can go to Iceland and put one foot on one side and one foot on the other. It's very volcanically active. It's just a particularly active spot. It's built up enough land to be above sea level. But there are a few others. The Azores uh, down through here, Ascension Island, you know, Bouvet Island, and some of the ones in the South Pacific. But it's rare. So this mountain range was discovered. And one thing I should point out before I move on, not only was this mountain range discovered, but they discovered that right in the middle of the mountain range is a valley. So it kind of goes up, and instead of a mountain peak, you kind of go up and then you go back down into this valley. So that was discovered. The second thing magnetometers began to be used in much more extent. Now, a magnetometer is a bit like a metal detector. You see some guy running around on the beach using it. It detects iron in a material. Now, as we start getting into different kinds of rocks this semester, there's a specific kind of uh, volcanic rock that records the direction of north at the moment that the minerals inside the rock nucleate and crystallize. So in other words, a rock comes out of a volcano like that molten orange stuff, lava. It begins to cool. And as the elements inside the mineral nuclei begin to crystallize, they record the direction of the North Pole at that moment of time. And it's something you can use a magnetometer and measure. It's pretty cool. It's like a little bit of a compass. Sir, do you know what the cycle is showing that the poles are supposed to support Yeah, so the, the North Pole, well, magnetic north is not the North Pole, right? We all know that. It's off a little bit. I think right now it's somewhere off the coast of northwest Greenland. It's off by several degrees. So you guys use maps and you have to adjust your compasses. The farther north you go, the more that declination, more severe it gets. I used to do field work up in the Arctic, and my compass was, you know, <laughs> north was here. My compass was pointing over here. So it was almost useless. I mean, it was useless to use from a mapping perspective. Um, but because... For reasons that are not entirely understood, every now and then, magnetic, magnetic north flips towards the south magnetic pole or the south pole. This happens irregularly. It doesn't happen every during a set period of time, but every now and then it flips. But when it comes to rocks and magnetism, these iron-rich minerals and nucleate inside the igneous rocks record the direction of north. So if you have a rock that's nucleating and growing here, it records which way, which way magnetic north was, whether it's today's world at some point in the past or if it was located in this southern direction. And yeah, the, the, this will flip again at some point in time. We don't know when. Sometimes it flips and flips back. Um, I don't think it's something that happens on a human time scale per se. I don't think it's something that's like a civilization buster. I think at best it messes up the compasses of you know, GPS units and compasses in general. So like your car would have to be, your phone would have to be recalibrated. That's about it. There's this thing called the dip needle, where the minerals inside the rock record the direction of north, but they also record their latitude. So if you pick up certain igneous rocks and use a sensitive de device like a magnetometer, you can figure out three different things. 
using today's technology. One, how, how many years in the past did the minerals nucleate? That's called absolute age dating. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the semester. You can record which direction north was. Was it northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere? And you can record the latitude that that rock nucleated. Gives you three pieces of information. So it's a bit like triangulating something on a map. You can figure out where that thing was when it nucleated. It's like tracking somebody down. What that allows us to do is map out where the rocks are in present day and then looking at older rocks through time, where they were. And so what essentially is what, what you're doing with this information is like, you know, if you see a car on the road someplace and you want to know where it's been, that's very difficult to do, isn't it? But what if it had snowed and you could follow its tracks right back? That's what we're doing with this information. You're mapping out where this stuff was and when. These things are called magnetic reversals. The Earth's field reverses every now and then, and that's recorded in these rocks. So we get when they crystallized, we get the latitude they were when they crystallized, and we get where was north. Was it the North Pole or the South Pole? Where was the magnetic north back in time? And these reversals that our planet does, they flip around. This is the, the last four million years. You can sort of see um, normal is this yellow color, and the reddish color would be what's called reversed, meaning it's pointed towards the South Pole. They flip back and forth. They kind of see it's relatively random in terms of how quickly it happens and how long it persists. But in the last four million years, we've had half a dozen or so. And so from a human time scale, it's, it would be unlikely to happen during our lifetime, maybe the lifetime of our civilization. But it does happen. It's not entirely understood why. I think it has to do with the spinning of the earth and the, the central iron core that flips on itself every now and then. Could it be like constricted because of that stuff? I don't think there's anything humans could possibly begin to do to cause that to happen. The Earth's origins is like the longest in your story. That's just four million years. We have records to go back a lot longer than that. This is not unusual at all. But it does tend to be a little random. And so after the Second World War, we, you know, we developed these drilling ships. And these drilling ships go out to sea and drill down into the crust. Not only do they explore for oil and gas and minerals and things like that, but purely from a scientific perspective, if you start along the Mid-Oceanic Ridge anywhere and drill and take samples to the west, and to the east and sample the rocks. You can do different kinds of things with those, those rocks. You can age date them, getting a physical age. You can take a look at the, the dip needle in the rocks, figure out you know, where they used to be. Because if you think about these plates moving around like ice on the pond, they change their latitude over time. And you also record which way magnetic north was. And if you plot that information like this on either side of the mid-oceanic ridge, you get a striped pattern in these magnetic reversals that mirror each other on either side, wherever you happen to go. So you get these magnetic reversals that mirror each other, and then when you age date the rocks, turns out that the stuff that's in the very middle is brand new. And today is where we go down here in subs and look at the volcanoes down here putting stuff out. And as you get away from these ridge crests, on either side, the rocks get progressively older, exactly the same on either side. So that it's like looking into a mirror. 
until you get to the edge of the ocean basins where they disappear. And the interesting thing about rocks that form in ocean basins is that the ages go from about present day to about 200 million years old. You don't find oceanic rocks any older than that anywhere in the world. That sounds pretty old, but like we talked about last time, you have to rewire your brain when it comes to geological time because when you get onto the continents, you find rocks that approach 4 billion years. And so that difference is pretty stark. You can walk outside here and find rocks that are 300 million years old. Can you say that's the reason why the continents are shifting? That's like pushing. It's pushing. So after the Second World War, we had, and we you know, began to develop technology, and we mapped this out. You got submarines to go down there and look and see what's going on. Yeah, it was discovered that the crust is being pushed on from below along these mid-oceanic ridges. And in the middle, you have magma coming out. And then it's moving away from the center, left and right over time, very slowly. And then as you get away from the center part of the ridge, the rocks get older and older and older. And that when the magma comes out to crystallize and form rock, at that moment of time, it records the magnetic polarity, records the age of the minerals that nucleate, and records where it is. So anyhow, when it comes to this stuff, you end up with a map of the ocean basin that looks a bit like this with respect to the ages of the rocks and the magnetic polarities. On either side of these ridges, Again, it's like looking at each other in a mirror. The rocks get progressively older to a point where you get something about 200 million years old, and that's it. And so at this point in time, um, you know, at this point, we're kind of maybe in the 1960s, something like that, late 50s, 60s, this idea of seafloor spreading began to take hold. Okay, maybe Alfred Wegener, which was laughed out of the room back in 1915, was on to something. Because now we've been, we have these tools and we have this technology to get down there and sample this stuff. It turns out that it looks like, yeah, these sea floor, this seafloor spreading thing, this, this is a process that's actually happening. So... You know, let's go ahead and fast forward to today's world and get past the history lesson a little bit. So yeah, sea floor spreading is a process of plate tectonics. We understand it in great gory detail in today's world. And we have these fancy tools where we can go down and measure all kinds of different things and see it happening, measure the rate, and all that. But it took a good, I would say, 70 years to go from this can't possibly be happening to, oh yeah, We've got this now. So it, this kind of process takes time. Somebody comes up with an idea. Other people go out and try to figure out if that's maybe what is actually happening by using tools and looking at the evidence and getting data. And that can take a lot of time. So this idea of seafloor spreading. Well, okay, so here along a mid-oceanic ridge is where the crust is being pushed up on from below. This white stuff right here is called oceanic crust. Oceanic crust is a dark, dense rock called basalt. Looks a bit like this guy right here. And this is, this is oceanic crust. It's dark. It's made up of iron and magnesium and lots of elements that have lots of protons in their nuclei. The more protons you put in the nuclei, the heavier it gets. Is that made up of iron and The minerals inside this rock have lots of iron, lots of magnesium, and other elements like gold and silver and whatever else. They have lots of protons in their nucleus, which makes it heavy. This guy is heavy for its size. That's the kind of rock that's produced 
right here along that 18,000 mile long mountain range. And it's a continuous process in areas along this mid-oceanic ridge. It's being driven by what are called convection cells down in the mantle. Now the mantle is like the white part of the egg. It's 82% of the Earth's volume, and it's this stuff right here in liquid form. I don't want to say liquid. It's more like a plasma, but you get the idea. This stuff is liquid, and it's hot. When you put this in liquid form, it's 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That heat down here needs to escape to the surface. The heat that's generated down here all the time, yeah? So could you mine the ridge and like smelt that down in separate metals, or it just be too, like, too much of a process? That is something that's beginning to be worked on now. It's only been in the last decade or two that we've had the technology to get down to this depth and actually mine it. And we're not even quite there yet. Uh, but we're close. That's the next frontier, for sure. As it, Mostly it's because it's so darn expensive. You need expensive ships. You need equipment that can get down to 15,000 feet and stay down there. And you need equipment that can be remotely operated. You need equipment. You need an ability to take something this heavy and get it up to the surface. That's not easy. And because you're talking about salt water, you need equipment that's not going to break down every other day. And so to make that economically feasible, we're only now getting to that point. But yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's a lot of heat being driven down here, being generated down here by the core, by radioactive decay going on inside the core. That heat radiates to the surface. And because the mantle is kind of this liquid slushy thing, you know, if you see pictures of lava running down the side of volcanoes, that kind of liquid slushy kind of thing, that's what it is. And the heat will concentrate in specific areas and push its way up to the surface in areas called upwelling. It's right up in here. The heat escapes at the surface, forms new rock, and then it sort of drives away from that, it gets pushed away from it, and cools a little bit here and drops back down into the mantle. Most things on our planet are driven by density. When it gets hot, it becomes less dense and it begins to rise to the surface. When it cools slightly, it becomes more dense and down it goes. That forms what's called a convection cell, where the heat is driven up to the Earth's surface to escape. It cools and it goes back down. This process, you know, we, we can see this happening now with technology. We can map out where these upwelling areas are. And most of them are along this mid-oceanic ridge. That's what's causing the continents to spread? Right. It gets pushed on from below, and it pushes the stuff apart. And then when it cools, it goes back down and pulls. So you get this push and pull thing going on, which forces it apart. As fast as your fingernail grows. Now, we have we can, so satellite stuff down. we can measure this going on. It's constantly happening. It's constantly moving. So when it, like, what determines when it gets hotter? Because uh, it's hotter down here and cooler up right, here. Right, so it's just like a constant cycle. It's constant like, cycle. The it's hot stuff hot. rises up, cools a little bit, comes back down. It's not, it's not like, oh, it'll get hotter and then cool down. Get hotter nope. And down. It's, it's what's happening down here in the core is a constant process. It's constantly generating heat, and it will for the life of our planet. And that heat has to escape. Over here, it the rocks get too dense to sit on top of the mantle anymore, and so they get pulled back down and recycled. It's Earth's great recycling system. So is there like a crack? Yeah. We'll get to it. Sort of. We'll get to it. And it's pretty cool. It's why oceanic rock is never that old, because when you get to be a certain age, when this rock gets to be about 140 to 200 million years old, it's too dense to ride on top of this semi-liquid stuff, and so it just sinks right back down again. 
Yeah, it's just that simple. That's pretty cool. Um, and it's a process that we had no idea existed on the planet. Stuff comes out, spreads apart. No effect in that kind of stuff, per se. Are the tides just more of federal inland tide fields, or do they have Yeah, yeah. The, the tides are, are, are driven by the moon. And as far as I can figure, there's no effect on that or that stuff at all. Independent. And yet, there's a process that goes on there that is quite unique. We'll talk about later on this semester. We got a lot to talk about. We got a lot to talk about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, seafloor spreading, once that was you know, discovered and mapped out and better understood. Yeah, yeah, okay, so, yeah, um, you know, fast forward today and we have uh, what are called plate boundaries. This seafloor spreading boundary is called a divergent plate boundary where the tectonic plates are pulling apart from one another. In today's world, we understand there are a dozen or so major tectonic plates the eggshell is broken up into about a dozen pieces and some smaller ones. They move around where they pull apart in seafloor spreading. That's called a divergent plate boundary. Where they smack into each other, that's called a convergent plate boundary. That's a big car wreck. And then where they slide past one another, that's called a transform plate boundary. And so by knowing the direction they're moving and the speed they're moving and how they interact, you can take that fast forward button on the remote. Yeah, and you can play games with where are they going in the future? Where have they been in the past? At some point, a couple hundred million years, years in the past, it was Pangea, but before that, they've been kind of going back and forth and banging into each other very slowly over time. Which are the transform ones or the convergent ones can cause earthquakes? Or like All of these can cause earthquakes. There's a the, the most famous transform plate boundary where they slide past one another. Uh, where am I? Right here. San Andreas Fault in California. Oh, I got you. San Andreas. San Andreas. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's not the only one. In fact, that doesn't generate as many earthquakes as uh, a convergent plate boundary. We'll talk about that. Does it really allow them to get like collapsible thing glasses? Like, makes your life go on. You know, there, there's probably websites you can go to and, and where they, they hit the fast forward button and figure out where this stuff is going to go in the future. But you're getting farther apart from Europe as fast as your fingernail grows. And so, you know, how, how long can a human fingernail get during a lifetime? That's as far away as you're, you're getting, you know. Yeah, that's yeah, pretty disgusting looking. You know, you, I mean, you, it's about yay far a year, something like that. So, you know, it's not very quick. It's not very far. So during your lifetime, really the only effects you're going to see from this are things like earthquakes and volcanic eruptions that result from it. Um, but over time, if you take this far and multiply that by 100 million, you get a pretty big distance. So again, different scales going on on the planet. And it's important to sort of keep that in mind. But still, this is the process that's driving everything else. And so what I'm going to do is I want to start with divergent plate boundaries and talk about convergent plate boundaries and talk about transform plate boundaries. So is that the from here to us? Uh, at the moment, the Atlantic is getting wider. The Pacific is being consumed. So from a short-term standpoint, the Atlantic's getting wider, the Pacific's getting smaller, but the Atlantic Basin is nearly as wide as it's physically capable of getting because the rocks along the edges here are getting quite old, 100 some odd million, 140 million years old. So it's probably gonna, gonna be about static. I think at the, at the moment, we're kind of in the mid-range of where things could be. So why is it like left and right? Why is what? Or is, why is it like towards South America or like Hawaii at the moment is kind of in the middle and staying put. 
while the ocean basin around it is being consumed. So everything's kind of coming towards Hawaii. Hawaii? No. no. Where'd you learn to use a compass? Where'd you learn to use a compass? Hawaii. Hawaii. All right, so let's talk about this divergent plate boundary and the process that's going on inside that. So first off, a divergent plate boundary can exist in a couple of different areas. It doesn't have to be out in the ocean. It can be out in the ocean, but it doesn't have to be out in the ocean. When it is out in the ocean, the type of rock is called oceanic lithosphere. And again, the oceanic lithosphere is this dark, dense stuff right here that doesn't ever get too old, at least in the oceans. The crust here, oceanic crust, is very thin. It's on the order of 5 to 15 kilometers thick, which sounds pretty thick, but it's actually not. Uh, you can nearly drill right through it, and we almost have. Now, if you contrast that with the continents, which is a different kind of rock, where we are right here, you're talking about 30 to 40 to 50 kilometers thick crust. It's quite different. So the crust here is very thin. And that's helpful because when the heat comes up down from the core and the deeper mantles of the ocean, it comes up, it can work its way through and punch through it relatively easily. Is that at all points, 75 to 50 kilometers? Or just at, at all points. It gets a little bit thicker out here and a little bit thinner in there. So when the hot magma comes up, is that heating the water or is it not? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It will heat down there. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it is, but it's not. So there's a lot of water that heats up in here and comes back out like geysers. So it'll cool down by the time. Yeah, but the water typically down there is about 28 it's degrees. Right above yeah. Like Things cool. called black smokers that we'll get to a little bit later on. So sand there are like the salt that's like further down. Like in some places, sand is. Hawaii, for example. A, a natural Hawaiian beach is black or green um, because of that. But not along the continents where we are here because that's a different process going on. So this crust is very thin, and right along the ridge itself is an area where it's volcanically active at all times, but not along the entire distance of the oceanic ridge, just in spots, like Iceland, for example, and other areas where it's an area where the heat is escaping over a specific region. These are not explosive volcanoes. By far, the most volcanic activity that's going on on our planet at any given time is along this 18,000 mile long mid oceanic ridge in spots. Magma just coming out all the time. There's so much heat being released, so much coming out all the time. But it's not explosive. And for the most part, other than in places like Iceland, we had no idea what was going on for thousands of years. But it is. And it's in these areas where the magma comes up and begins to work its way through that very thin crust of basaltic rock on its way to the surface. It goes up through things called sheeted dikes. Most of it, by far, most of it gets stuck underground, cools, and solidifies to form a rock called gabbro, which looks or basalt. Uh, like this. But some of it comes out on the surface to form um, a volcanic rock. As it works its way up to the surface, it goes through things called sheeted dikes. When it comes out on the surface, it forms what are called pillow basalts. We'll look at these. And then it splits and moves away as the crust, as these tectonic plates are moving. Sheeted dikes look a bit like this. You know, Where's this? No, that's in Southern Africa. What continent? I'll tell you the. Oh, that was like a chain or something, right? That's definitely in Asia. What's that? No, it's in Asia. 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 Asia.
Yeah, yeah, the lived at the top. Yeah, yeah, the, the claw, bear, bear's claws did that. That's right. Yeah, that's grass. You can go watch Close Encounters of the Third Kind. That's all. This was in that movie. Yeah, you can actually you can climb to the top and uh, rappel back down. So no, no, you can do it as long as you have a permit. Yeah, yeah. But if you get a permit, you can go up. Now, yeah. well, I know people have done it. I mean, they do it. I mean, there are areas where you have these little ledges and stuff. It's, it's not so bad, but no. <laughs> no, 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 no. So you have these uh, cracks in the rock that, that when they solidify, form these polygons called sheeted dikes. But when the Lava comes out at the surface, it forms what's called a pillow basalt. And a pillow basalt looks like this. Um, and what happens is that you get this 2,000 degree magma that comes out at the surface to form lava. And it hits 28 degree ocean water. And it instantly kind of solidifies. And as it does so, it kind of pushes out to form this pillow shape called pillow basalt. And these stack up on top of one another. <laughs> you know, it looks about this. This is a what's uh, this is a high quality video by the way, but you get the idea. It hits this ocean water, which is very cold, and it forms these pillow shapes. And I think this video shows it underwater like that. It's because it's cooling so quickly that it doesn't form like a layer, a flat lying layer forms these pillow pillows as it comes out. You can, if you dive down there in places like Hawaii, you can sometimes get relatively close, but you don't want to get too close, but relatively close and see it. It, it can be kind of explosive too, where it kind of spits out things at you, you know? Sort of, sort of. It's still really hot coming out. So like in areas of the world like Iceland and Hawaii and other areas where that, that basaltic lava comes out on the surface to form a lava flow, the top part of it will solidify very quickly within seconds usually. But it stays quite hot. It will melt your boot bottoms if you walk on it. Um, so there's a fine line there between being able to do it and then melting your boots. You know, like uh, some of those movies you see. No, because the ocean basin at that depth is about the same. It's uniform around the world. Oh, it's still the same degree. Yeah. Give or take. Okay. Yeah. So a mature divergent boundary looks like this. Did I say 18,000 miles? I guess I'm sorry. I meant 42,000 miles. So it's quite long. Yeah, sorry. Scratch that. That's a mature divergent plate boundary. Now, what I want to do is go back in time a little bit and talk about how they initially form. Because that is relative to where we live here in Virginia. So I'll put that into a little bit of a story about how they begin to actually form. But I'll stop it there for today. Um, the Monday lab crowd for today, please bring your laptop. And uh, what I'm sure you've heard it's a relatively quick lab. Uh, we'll log into Pearson, so make sure you have your access code and they can do that.